in a lot of ways was a pretty conventional economist. He was trained at MIT in the late 60s and early 70s. His um, dissertation advisor was Franco Modigliani, who actually co-authored a couple of papers that sort of led the way to the rise of rational market finance and economics. So it wasn't like he was being edited, I mean, it wasn't like he was being educated by a bunch of hippies out in an ashram or something. He was getting a very mathematical, conventional economic education. But at the same time, I mean, really, as I tell it in the book, it, this, this idea arose kind of simultaneously, and there was a lot of cross-pollination at MIT in Chicago. But at MIT, there was always this sense of, here's this great model for understanding how the market works, and also, we totally agree that the market is pretty hard to outsmart. We don't know that it's smart, but it is hard for other people to outsmart. But we, we're not so sure that means that it's all working perfectly. Whereas at Chicago, it became this project to sort of show how great markets were and how much better they were than any government bureaucrat. So all along at MIT, from the beginning, it was this weird coexistence of these very rationalist theories of how the world worked coupled with this kind of understanding and, and a lot of classroom discussion about how the world didn't work quite the way it was described in the mathematical models in the classroom. And so you got people coming out of MIT and, and Schiller's classmate, Robert Merton, um, a Nobel Prize winner, very sort of the high priest for a while of this rationalist finance, was there at the same time and came out with a very different worldview. So Schiller came out with this conventional training but this sense that all these theories and models weren't entirely right. And, and, he, and, and he had a lot of computer skills, empirical skills, and so he started during the 70s to just try to test some of these theories about market behavior against the data. And initially, he was looking at bond prices and, and didn't come up with anything all that explosive. But then starting in the late 70s, he started looking at stock prices and was trying to come up with a measure of whether they reflected the fundamental value of the stocks themselves. And so he just compared stock prices to, div to subsequent dividend payments and found that the dividend payments were a lot less volatile than the stock price movements. And that wasn't proof of anything. A lot of people argued, well, companies try to keep their dividends smooth, therefore it shouldn't mean that much, but other people did similar examinations of earnings, comparing them with stock prices. And, and basically the lesson was there seemed to be a lot of unexplained volatility in the stock market. And, and later on, other people, including some pretty conventional finance scholars like Richard Roll at UCLA, basically confirmed Schiller's observation. And so Schiller then, he actually went and paid, paid attention to real estate for about 10 years, but when he came back to paying attention to the stock market again in, in the mid to late 90s, it was just with this idea that there were these periods when prices went off in directions that had less to do with anything going on with the fundamentals than, in just, than mood swings. And, and so that, that sort of led him by the late 90s to be this really prominent um, doubter about the bull market of those days. And then he came out with, I mean, it was, he totally admits this was luck, but with the most spectacularly timed book of all time, in March 2000, um, published Irrational Exuberance. And March 2000 was exactly when that exuberance started to tail off and end. So he wrote Irrational Exuberance in 2000, and then he went back to paying attention to real estate um, and wrote a new version of the book that came out in 2005, making the point that, wow, real estate prices had gone really crazy by historical standards, and we could probably expect sometime in the next few years a collapse in real estate prices. And, and so he, he's now even more of a guru than ever before because he really did at some level predict what happened, not, not in the details, not at the timing, but he at a time when conventional wisdom was that the real estate market was not a big danger, he was saying it every day. What's interesting about Schiller is his lesson that he takes from all this is not that we somehow need to shut down markets or regulate them vastly more heavily. I mean, I think he'd be in favor of somewhat more regulation. But he seems to think that if only we had even more financial products, if we could all, if we we're all buying and selling real estate derivatives, betting that our house prices might fall, then we would have been better off. So in, 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 it, it sort of comes back around to that MIT belief in markets and conventional economics in the end. Um, he, so it, and, and he, he goes and he's, he's very often paired with Nassim Taleb, an options trader turned 
sort of bomb-throwing market philosopher, and Schiller comes across as, as the conservative or the moderate in all of those discussions now. I mean, his belief is continued growth of the financial system is a good thing. We just have these shakeouts where we figure out what doesn't work. I guess my one caveat to that, because then I, after he said that, I went back and was trying to look at a lot of, because finance professors always bring this up, that there's a lot of comparative global research showing that countries with better developed financial systems do better than those without them. But it's mostly research about developing countries. And, and it sort of stands to reason that a company where nobody has a, ba a country where nobody has a bank account is not going to progress as fast economically as one where there are banks and, and loans available. But I don't know that, I think once you get to a well-developed economy with big financial system, I'm sure there's some point of diminishing returns. And I, it's pretty clear we reached that in the U.S. over the past decade where you get a financial system that sort of takes on a dynamic of its own and is no longer serving the economy as a whole, but is just kind of churning for its own benefit and, and, and kind of sucking off lots of money from the system. So, I, and I, I imagine we will start getting a lot of research now about whether there is any way to tell what, what's that point where your financial system has gotten too big. Um, and I don't think Schiller would disagree with that. He, he just in the end still believes in finance and that it can do good things for people.